thank you so much for coming. As I said, this is the first time I think that the Young Greens have ever hosted any internal um, hustings for uh, any hustings for the internal leadership or deputy leadership. And we've got those coming up soon as well as the um, uh, hustings for the House of Lords candidates. So we're really excited to be hosting these and we're so excited to have a huge audience of Young Greens joining us tonight. Um, so I can see lots of familiar faces that I recognise and some new ones and some new names. So welcome back if you've been to lots of our online calls over these weeks of lockdown. Um, I know that if you've been to these before, you'll probably have heard us talk about how this is obviously a really weird and difficult time. The kind of coronavirus crisis has thrown all sorts into the air and we've been talking an awful lot about how the coronavirus hasn't just created a crisis, but it's really revealed the deep flaws in our political system and shown that we desperately, desperately need to take radical steps towards a new kind of society. Um, and, at the, in, and, and in some ways, like at the same time, we've also seen an awful lot of people, more and more people, in fact, recognise that clearly the system isn't fixed and actually there's a world to win here. And now is a really exciting time to be thinking about how we can rebuild society in a completely new way. Um, so we're delighted to have the Green Party leadership happening here with us uh, happening now because it's a really exciting time to think about um, how what role the Green Party plays um, in that movement in shaping that future and so these elections for the leadership of our party um, and also for the House of Lords come at this really important time and it's really uh, vital that as young people we have our voices heard we engage and we have um, uh, and we're able to vote in these elections. So we're delighted for you to come. We think it's a really exciting time to be thinking about the future of our party. And thank you very much. Before we do kick on, I know Tom is going to be hosting. I should have said before, I'm Rosie Rule. I'm one of the Young Greens co-chairs, if you don't know me. We've also got Tom Hazel on the call, who's going to give a wave, who's going to be hosting. But before I do send over to him, I'm going to send you over to Katrina, who's also on our Young Greens committee. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what else is coming up before we kick off. So over to you, Katrina. Hello, thanks Rosie. Um, yes, as Rosie said, I'm Katrina and I'm the events officer for the Young Greens. Um, thank you for all joining us. Really exciting to see so many people here and thanks for our candidates for coming along as well. Um, we are the Young Greens and if you've been on a Young Greens call before, as we've done quite a lot over the last few uh, months, you'll know we love to plug stuff. Uh, so that's what I'm doing just now. Um, and what we have got coming up at the moment is internal democracy. Woo! Even more of it. I know Rosie already made us, already made us woo, but I'm doing it again. Um, yes, yeah, so we have just closed nominations for our Young Greens um, Executive Committee. And we have some amazing people standing. I'm really excited to kind of see how it's going to um, unfold because I think we've got a great, great lineup. Um, we're going to be a great decision for next year. Um, so I'm just going to open my list of dates to tell you about. So on the 1st of August, we are going to have our hustings for the Young Greens executive. Um, and then uh, the voting will open. So anyone who is a Young Green, so if you are a Green Party member under the age of 30 uh, or a full-time student, you are a Young Green. Um, so the voting will open the 1st of August after our first hustings. And then we will have our online convention. So we normally have this in person, but we're trying it online this year um, on the 15th and 16th of August. So pop those dates in your diary now and uh, we'll give you some links to those uh, at the end. So now I will throw you over to Tom, who's going to be hosting our leadership hostings now. Thank you so much, Katrina and Rosie, for that kind of introduction. Uh, my name is Tom Hazel, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Young Greens, and I'll be chairing tonight's hostings. Uh, so just before we start, I wanted to run through the rules and tell you how to ask your questions to the candidates tonight as well. Uh, so firstly, as viewers, please keep yourself muted throughout the hostings. Uh, fairly standard stuff. Uh, so my sidekick, Isaac, who's doing the moderating tonight, won't have to kick you out, uh, albeit that's something you'll probably enjoy. Uh, secondly, the way this will work tonight um, won't be too different to all the hustings you've been to over the past couple of weeks. We're going to start off with each of the candidates giving a five minute introductory speech and telling you why they think Young Green should vote for them. Uh, and then we'll move straight into the questions. We've got some pre-submitted questions that you uh, might have filled in when you filled in the Action Network form to get here. And if you've got any more questions you'd like to ask tonight, could you send a private Zoom message to Rosie with it? Uh, her name is conveniently Rosie, questions here, so I don't think you can miss her. Uh, and she'll pass them on to me. Uh, and then we'll try and finish about bang on 9.30 uh, with some final appeals to the candidates so you can get back to your kind of uh, lockdown evening activities, uh, wherever they may be. Uh, so with that being said, we'll try and get straight into it so we have uh, maximum possible time to answer your questions. Uh, we're going to go uh, in the order of Rosie, then Sean, then Shaha for these introductory speeches. Uh, and once again, there'll be five minutes. Uh, so sorry, guys, if I have to interrupt you uh, on the five minute mark, but we'll be fairly strict about that. Uh, and, and straight over to Rosie. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, so 
thanks for inviting us along and thanks for for running this hustings for the for the young greens as well it's great to to talk to you all um i'm rosie and last year i was elected to solihull council and we're the main opposition to the tories so there we have real influence to hold the conservatives to account and also to draw attention to issues that matter the green party has seen similar successes up and down the country it's amazing how far we've come in the last few years and i'm inspired by the hard work that's brought us here but for me where we are isn't good enough. On the doorstep, there are three stereotypes of the Green Party that really hurt us. And maybe they're a little bit unfair, but if they sting, it's because there's an element of truth to them. First, that the Green Party is for white middle-class vegans. Now, some of my friends are white middle-class vegans, but the problem is people who don't fit that profile think we're not for them. Secondly, many people think we're a well-meaning single issue pressure group, but don't trust us to govern well. And those suffering from poverty and discrimination in their everyday lives don't think we're interested in those issues. And worst of all, a green vote is a wasted vote because we just can't win. We have some choices to make. We have a fantastic supportive community and we're part of a wider movement. But is that all we are? Or do we want to be a serious political party who could one day be in government? We have some great policies which have been badly recycled by the larger parties. But is that good enough? Or do we want to win the power to implement those policies and do it properly? We're an effective pressure group, but are we happy with that? Or do we want to become a major political force in this country? I want to see the Green Party take that next step. This means we need to be serious about inclusion, serious about credibility, and serious about winning elections. Let's unpack those a little bit. So these are the changes that I would like to see. We need to be serious about inclusion. We need to be, make sure that everyone who shares our values, whoever they may be, can find a home in the Green Party. We've got to do better at meeting with people and communities who are not like us and making them feel welcome. We need to listen to people who don't think of themselves as Greens and talk about the issues that affect their daily lives with the same passion that we bring to our environmental campaigning. We need to be serious about credibility. And voters love the way we care about the environment, but we still need to convince them that we can deal with everything else too. We need better answers to people who say we haven't thought through how our good ideas will work in practice. We need our policies to be backed by experts, professionals and the scientific consensus. We need to take a hard look at our policy and how we make it and make sure both are fit for a major party in the 21st century. Giving members the final say on our policies is one of our great strengths. But now we need to make expert input and scrutiny a non-negotiable part of that process. Finally, we need to be serious about winning elections. The UK's voting system desperately needs reform, but to get it, we have to focus on winning under first past the post when most voters think that's impossible. We have a mountain to climb. We have a proven system for success in local elections, which is now delivering green councillors up and down the country. We need to take this further by developing evidence-led, data-driven strategies to send more MPs to Westminster. That will take serious focus and investment of time and resources starting now. I believe it's time for us to change. We need to be serious about inclusion, serious about credibility, and serious about winning elections. I want to lead a conversation in the party about how we make these changes and work together to become the truly effective Political, political voice of the Green Movement. If you want that too, then make me your first choice for leader. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, and now we'll move on to Sean for her opening speech, please. 
Thank you so much. Um, and it's really nice to see all of you. Some of the hustings have had the, the screens turned off and I find that so disturbing. It's so nice to actually see some faces. Um, so the, the questions I've been asked to address are, why should the Young Greens vote for you and how will you work with the Young Greens if elected? So um, to start off with uh, the question of why you should vote for me. Basically, I just want to shout out because I love you so much. Because I do, I mean, I genuinely, the Young Greens are, the most exciting part of the party for me. I'm, I'm energized every time I spend time at an event and I'm hoping that by 9.30 I'll still feel that way. Um, but I've got to chuck some praise at you. Your, your record of backing up our electoral actions of all the branches of the party, of all the groups within the party, you understand that, that helping in the target areas is the key to success and you organise these incredible action days that, that make such a difference. That honestly has been, it's what's kept a lot of us going, the fact that the Young Greens are there to support us. You've also got tremendous ethics, tremendous communication skills, and you've been tremendous in campaigning, particularly on uh, rights and allyship with the other groups within the Green Party. I think, you know, that all of that is amazing. And again, your, your, your huge amount of enthusiasm and the commitment that you bring, especially when I know through all of my work, how hard life is now for younger people, how many hours you work, how insecure things are for you in your lives, your homes. The fact that, that young Greens are putting in so much time and effort to this party makes me so, so proud of you. Um, so, so yeah, just because I love you so much, basically. Um, but also, how will you work with the young Greens if I'm elected? And I think that's a really important question that's to do with what our strategy should be over the next um, years. We've got some incredibly important elections coming up in the next year and your support in those um, not just by doing action days but but the support behind the communications the support by for getting us that um, extra amount of credibility through showing that, that there is public support out there will be absolutely crucial um, and we are really getting somewhere in the in the London elections in the last poll if you add up the first and second preferences um, I'm second <laughs> now that's completely I'll show you a chart now here you go there's me first and second preferences I'm second and that is that shows how small the credibility gap that Rosie highlights actually is. There are people out there really, really keen on us, but actually just waiting to see that last bit of credibility that we are. Um oh, I think uh, it, 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 oh, there we go. Sean's back. It's actually, Zoom just closed itself. I'm really sorry about that. That's all right. We'll give you an extra 30 seconds on the end of your uh, where did, I, well. where did I get to? Did I, did I start saying that you're a mass movement? You're that, that sort of, is that what you got? You were just mm. finishing off talking about next year's elections. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Obviously, obviously there are the elections in Wales and um, you know the, the, the fact that when we, when we pick a target region we're going to have to pile in there and build up some momentum. I think you're going to be fantastic at doing that. But then also the third point in our three-point platform, which I'm sure you've you've heard already um, that we need these clear new messages we need more credibility but also we need to start winning change now we need to be working with allies with uh, different campaigns actually persuading and forcing you know making it impossible for the government now the people in charge of councils now the mayor of london now to start making some of the changes that are in our upcoming manifestos because actually you know the climate and the social uh, emergency that we have cannot wait. So that's something I think that the Young Greens are particularly good at. Um, and as leader, as co-leader, you vote for me to carry on, I will listen to you and I will take up the issues you raise for, for me to, to um, focus on. And I know that you'll, you'll be thinking now, well, of course they're going to say that, but I can prove to you that you know, that you can see that I'm not just saying that because this has absolutely characterised all of my work on the London Assembly for the past four years. I've taken up the issues around youth centres, I've taken up the issues around renting um, and housing and, and worked alongside young campaigners setting up things like the London Renters Union, uh, people from London Youth, and Hannah's probably not here, but she's had been absolutely fantastic um, at helping to, to spread the word about the work that I'm doing there. And it's, and it's 
been great because we've won changes to renters' rights, we've won money for youth services, but also it's won us credibility and more votes. And that's why we're in that strong position now in London. And this needs to continue. And it feels to me like all the different campaigns that are going on, these, these big mass mobilizations in aid of different issues are being led by young people that are actually making a difference but they're just points of light and they need to be made into a mass movement with real political values ethics and a, and a coherent program behind it and that's the key messages that we're starting to develop about the fact that there's system change needed and only system change will do but I think it will require working with young people to turn that into a mass movement and so yes I think I will work with you so hard because you are the future of the party you are how we get to that mass movement and the rest of the party needs to be listening to you and finally why are there no young greens standing for leadership you must be put forwards to people to stand for leadership in every election this is absolutely crucial and I'm, I'm uh, glad that you did not do that <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much Sean. Uh, and then finally for our introductory speeches we'll move over to Shaha I think you're muted. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Thanks very much. Firstly, just a huge thanks to Rosie, Tom and everybody behind the scenes. I, I know how much um, work has gone into this. It's absolutely phenomenal. And it's a great turnout, actually. It's, that is one of the biggest, I think the other candidates can attest to, one of the biggest um, level of participants we have had for these hustings. And I really, just to, I really warmed to um, Sean's um, opener there. Um, Firstly, I've got the two questions as well, so I will come to those. Why should the Young Greens vote for me and how I will work with you um, if elected? But I really just wanted to start by saying I've always been struck by the enthusiasm, the energy, the high competency skill of the Young Greens in every department. And we as a party would be nowhere um, for sure, we want to be firing on all the cylinders and doing more. But if you look at every election campaign, uh, the last one in particular, if you just think how much uh, our candidates, our lead candidates, were relying on uh, young Greens um, coming to their constituencies and just working their socks off. And that, all that hard graft is just a real, I have great admiration for. Um, what I wanted to say is, firstly, why am I standing? I think it's all about... The youth and the young greens of course you know if this had been a hall i might have asked how many of you are in full-time education and of course many of you will be uh, some of you won't be and it's a you know it's it's a diverse population in itself the young greens of any political parties and, and ours is is no exception to that and maybe we want to be even more diverse but i would say that ultimately everything that the green party is about is about the younger generation and now if you look at the youth uh, today, and whether it's climate strikes or people striking from school or converging on Westminster, they really are showing the rest of us the way and, and putting our politicians to shame. I mean, how appalling it was to have um, often school children, um, the younger generation converging on Westminster only to be told off effectively by our parliamentarians and Theresa May, you know, such a patronizing attitude. And what I would give to have um, the youth of today in Parliament, not just votes at 16, actually running the show. I think we'll be in a damn sight better position because you understand, we un you understand what the Greens across the board understand. It's the climate emergency. And that's the number one reason that I'm standing, because I want to make sure that we are an empowered political movement, not just at the ballot box, not just as an election machine, if you want to call it that, but also galvanizing action in our campaigning, Extinction Rebellion, and all those other organizations that you campaign alongside. So in terms of, I also want to say a little bit about my track record as um, your deputy leader. Some of you may have been in the party at that time of the Green Surge um, under Natalie's stewardship, so to speak. Um, I was deputy leader and um, alongside Amelia as well. We had a, you know, a great uh, election in 2015. Um, I was not just working on the elections, I was up and down the country uh, speaking at uh, Young Green events um, in universities, whether you know Warwick, Cambridge, uh, Northamptonshire, you know, across the board. And I think one of the things that I would want to do 
as your leader is not just to do the vitally important work of externally representing the party, but to make sure that I was hearing you, listening to you, engaging your events, speaking out on your behalf, and especially finding out what your key current concerns were. And I think it's vitally important. I do see, unfortunately, um, a bit of a, a disconnect, if you will, between um, GPEC, some of our governing bodies, and how the rest of the party operates. And I think I would do everything in my power to try and overcome that through effectively relationship building. I think everything's about, you know, whether internal politics, wider politics, we need to build relationships, trust, and make sure that young Greens are represented at every level. I was absolutely delighted, despite the fact that, um, you know, there might not be any young Greens in this particular part of the contest. It's absolutely fantastic to see how many young Greens have put themselves forward for GPEX generally. And so that is, that is really a delight to see. And for sure, it would be great um, to have uh, young Greens at the table uh, running the show um, in, in our governance. So I would say, how long have I, I've got, I have probably got about half a minute, have I? 25 seconds. <laughs> All right. Just a few key points, which I hope to elaborate um, in the rest of the hustings to come. We're looking at unprecedented challenges, I think, for the youth of today. We've got intergenerational inequity in terms of the housing stock, the complete impossibility of getting onto the so-called housing ladder, um, student debt, our policies are not just meant for the wider public, they're meant for you as well, in terms of you know, writing off student debt. It wasn't so long ago that I had actually paid off my student loan, even though I wasn't having to pay for fees on That's, top of it. That's uh, five minutes there, Shaha. Thanks very much, and I, um, thanks very much, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, so thanks to all the candidates for those introductory speeches. Uh, and I'm really sorry to anybody who's relying for close, on closed captioning there, because they seem to have dropped out about halfway through those speeches, uh, but we'll try and get those fixed. Uh, in the middle of these questions. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the questions and we're going to start with some of the ones that have been pre-submitted by uh, young Greens who are signing up to the events. Uh, and on this first question, uh, the order that we're going to run through is going to be uh, first uh, Sean, then Rosie, then Shaha, and we'll be rotating the order in which the candidates answer those questions um, through the hustings, as I'm sure they used to, uh, to give them a kind of fair amount of time uh, for answering the questions. Uh, so the first question we're going to ask today is quite a young people specific one and, and the question is this, today's teenagers will become tomorrow's voters. What more can the Green Party do over the next two to four years to engage, educate, convince young people of current non-voting age that the Green Party is worth campaigning for and voting for? And I'll put that question in the chat and repeat it at the start um, of every candidate's speeches. Was it me first? Yeah, sorry, Sean, over to you. Okay, um, brilliant. I mean, I, I go to a lot of, I don't know, I don't, I'd stay in my flat all day, but I do normally go to quite a lot of um, school talks and I know that uh, young people come in to uh, political education into their sixth forms, into their, their fifth forms and fourth forms. They do that with, with a really open mind. And so when you go in and talk to, to schools and you um, run them through the, 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 the talk, the um, political compass, and you talk about the, the different things that are going on and the, and the historical um, power imbalances and, and the difference that, that Greens are making around the country and all of those different things that you, you run through with them, they're, they're super interested and they absolutely do understand this, this time scale of climate action and ecological action and the fact that, that if we don't act as soon as we can, then these things are going to be ruined and completely irrecoverable uh, in their lifetimes. But at the same time, if they're still in school and they're not able to vote, they don't yet have a stake in this. And this, this really, you know, this comes across in the Q and A's that you have um, with with young people. And and I think we we absolutely owe it to them to to create a party in which they can be active and feel like they have some control over the process and, and it can't all be about elections uh, therefore that's why trying to make sure that we're building a, a stronger campaigning arm of the party that obviously intersects with the fact that we're trying to to win seats um, but that that is really really important so that so that those younger people who feel like there's this big enormous thing coming down the line that you can't do anything about feel like they have some control over and they have some way of getting active within a party that that will respect them now i think that's something the greens really have in in spades that labor do not I can't even imagine what it's like joining labor as an 18 year old and going along to one of their branch meetings 
um, where everything's about factions and nobody can speak and all of those kinds of things. I don't know how many of you here have ever been in Labour and gone to one of their branch meetings or as I do I often meet the Labour councillors that I sit with in my ward after they've just been to one and they look ashen face they are not they have not had a good time at those meetings and and I think you know we have the, the absolute opportunity to create a welcoming day for them. And I'm very, very excited by the work that we're doing within the party at the moment to build more online spaces. And I think that, you know, a, a, an online space is, is absolutely ideal for, for striking up, um, you know, no expectations relationships with, with younger people um, who want to get involved and have debates. And I think, you know, the Young Greens have done some amazing events lately. They, you had me along to one to talk about housing rights, where I banged on like this from this seat, talking about um, housing rights and our campaigns for renters. Um, but also you had some fantastic, you know, people like Asan Raymond come in and talk, you know, just brilliant stuff. So um, yes, I think, you know, this kind of event, these kinds of educational, which is good um but also you know education in the sense that at that age young people are reaching out and trying to learn as much as possible and find their place in the world and giving them a place to come that's that's safe that's respectful that's also exciting that's also making change happen is what we can really do and i think we've got this new infrastructure this new digital infrastructure new campaigning infrastructure coming in where this will this will create this this space where we can potentially do what i said which is build a mass movement of people who really do feel like the Green Party is their their home and their permanent home and not something um, temporary or off-putting which I think we people we do we have in the past done too often to people. Perfect thank you very much Sean and um, so we'll move over to our next answer which will be from Rosie. Thanks Tom. I think by and large, an awful lot of young people already share our values. I think when we talk about Green Party values, I did a hustings. I was a general election candidate last year, and my favourite hustings was one we did at a sixth form college. And I could tell when I was in there that a large number of the people there were already on our side. I didn't have to sell anything. It was, they were already asking the right questions. Uh, they were concerned about all the, all the issues that, that we think are important. So I think it's not a question of selling the Green Party to anyone. Um, what I think we do need to do is we need to address some of the reasons that people don't already join the Green Party. And that's one of the big things that I want to look at as part of my pitch, because we need to make sure that people feel that the Green Party is for them, that they can feel at home here, whatever their background, wherever they come from, whoever they are. And I know that the Young Greens are great when it comes to, to this side of things. Some of our older members perhaps maybe struggle a little bit more with some of the issues around inclusion. I know there's been a lot of debate in the party about some of these issues recently. Um, and that's something that I really want to address because I want to make sure that whatever group people come from, they feel comfortable with us. Um, I think we need to address the issue of credibility because we need people to believe that we've got the capability to govern. So that we could actually be in government, we could run the country. And I think we've got some way to go before we can confidently say that and before people will believe us when we say that, when we put that across to them. Um, and then finally, we need to convince people that a green vote will matter. And that means we've got to be strategic about how we go about elections. Um, we need to make sure that we've got those systems in place, that we're using everything we know about winning elections, we're targeting correctly, and that we know that those votes will count. And once we can show people that we're delivering those results, we're already starting to at a local level with uh, more and more green councillors coming through. So people in those areas are getting used to having elected Greens representing them and they can see the good work that we do. And that is how we'll build on that. So for you here, I mean, I want you to be our next generation of activists and councillors and assembly members and MPs. I mean, I hope some of the people in, on this Zoom call will go on to be Green MPs. I, that's my vision. I, I want that for the party. And, uh, that's how I think we will, uh, we will get the effective political voice that we need. 
Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, and just before we move to Shaha for his answer, uh, I'm going to repeat the question. And the question was, today's teenagers will become tomorrow's voters. What more can the Green Party do over the next two to four years to engage, educate and convince young people of current non-voting age that the Green Party is worth campaigning for and voting for? So over to Shaha for his answer to this question. Thanks, Tom. Um, so like Sean, I've um, engaged with, with many school audiences over the years. Um, and it's, it's a real pleasure and delight. Even the 2019 general election, I was in one of the schools in, in Tower Hamlets and it was just absolutely phenomenal. Um, all the parties were represented and it, it's quite painful actually to, um, for these classes and the course leaders to actually run ballots. And I have not been to a single, like whether it's a mock hustings or just a round table event where the Greens didn't come out on top. I just find, I find that phenomenal. It's, it's inspiring. And you do wonder, what is it that happens? Is it something through age that people lose their, their vision, their idealism? Is it idealism or is it something else? Do people become jaded? I think honestly that what the Greens have is both idealism and realism in spades. Because the fact is, is that we're coming up against this climate emergency like there's no tomorrow. Um, this generation and the younger generation in particular will be most having to suffer the brunt of it. And yet they're not the ones with their hands on, on, the, on, the, on the levers of power right now. And it's incredibly frustrating because they see clearly exactly what's going on. They have science lessons. They, have, they listen to the news just as much as anybody, you know, maybe more so, and they get it. They care about other planetary species that we share this planet with and they don't want to bring everybody, all those other species down with us. So yes, absolutely, I want to see, I want to help um, organize campaigns um, around whether it's Extinction Rebellion, um, Schools for Strike. What we have to have, I think, is a bit more of relationship building within those campaigns. I was a founding signatory of Extinction Rebellion actually in October 2018, when we were kind of raising the alarm, trying to galvanize action around this. And that's something, frankly, which the Green Party could have been doing. And it's, you know, it's easy to criticise, isn't it? I mean, I know how hard it is to kind of rationalise the limited resources we have nationally, prioritise campaigns, elections, and we have snap general elections. You know, these consume tremendous amounts of energy and financial resources. But we've got to make sure that we've got this vision to link in with those campaigns, try and get better at mobilising and I think it's often through, it's not osmosis as such, but it is more informal contact that people build trust. It's all that education that happens in between. I work, just finally, I work um, quite closely with an organisation called Uprising, which I hope some of you have heard of. It's, it's a youth organisation, particularly that tries to build leaders from within BME communities. And there's a few parliamentarians and Terrans involved in that. I've launched the Environmental Leadership Programme and it's absolutely phenomenal again to see what vitality um, the youth of today have. They understand, they get it and they want action just like you and I want action. Thank you. Thank you Shaha and that concludes the candidates responses to those questions. Uh, so for the next question uh, the order we're going to be running through is Rosie then Shaha then Sean. Uh, and this question is uh, a question that's been asked tonight, and it is quite a topical question. Uh, the question is, the Green Party may be about to form the new administration at the local council in Brighton and Hove. What would you do to support the Green Group there, especially young councillors there, as they come under a lot of pressure from the press? Uh, so uh, we're going over to Rosie to answer that question first. This is a question that's actually um, really close to my heart because we're in a position in Solihull where we're hoping that in the next couple of election cycles we'll be able to take over the Solihull Council and we've been talking a lot about what we need to do in order to be in a position to to run the council effectively because the last thing you want when you take over a council is for things to if thing if things don't go to plan it's very easy for that to then be portrayed as oh it's those greens again they don't know what they're doing and even if it's the same thing that another party would have had those same problems um because we do still struggle with that um that credibility in the mind of voters i think we really struggle with with those issues so what i would want to be looking at um 
is what support those councillors need in place in order to do the best job that they can and whether that's a question of providing resources providing knowledge um, again we've got a wealth of knowledge across the organization um, there's a lot of councillors in different places so whether there's something that we can do in terms of um, helping out from that point of view or whether it's simply a question of um, helping to, to push to messaging via the national party that uh, will be helpful around those things um, I'd also want to, I mean, obviously the, the most important thing would be to sit down with the councillors on the ground there and say to them, what help do you need from us? What can we do to support you in this situation? You know, is it a question of uh, resources? Is it a question of messaging? Is it, is it expertise? Um, I know that there will be councillors there who've had experience of being in administration before, so it's not a first time thing for them, as it would be for for us um, so again it's drawing on what's already known what expertise they already have under those circumstances um, i think obviously the next election cycle will also be critical for consolidating that position so that's something that i think is, is going to be important to go into early I, again i don't know the group down in brighton very well i'm sure that they're already thinking about this I'm sure they're already thinking along those lines. So again, my role would be to, to have those conversations and rather than saying, I think this is what you need to do, it's a question of saying, well, what do you need from us? And it's much more about listening and being responsive rather than telling people how to do things because they've got the experience on the ground there. They know what works in their area. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so we're gonna go over to Shaha in just a second, but I'm gonna repeat the question again. Uh, so the Green Party may be about to form the new administration on the local council in Brighton and Hove. What would you do to support the Green Group there, especially young councillors there as they come under a lot of pressure from the press? So over to you, Shaha. Thanks, Tom. Well, now I, like uh, many stalwarts in the party and young Greens, of course, have campaigned in Brighton, um, not just for Caroline Lucas, but also to get councillors in. Um, and I, it's an amazing uh, organisation there. And of course, we've been here before. We have had um, control. We have had to, had to take difficult decisions and have great responsibility. With power comes responsibility. And I think this is a huge opportunity for us, again, to show that. Um, I mean, I always used to have a little bit of a quip um, when I was putting together candidates for um, local elections. Um, I ran the first uh, full slate in Brent in 2010, 63 candidates. I was told it couldn't be done. And I said, well, yes, it can. So, you know, let's, let's get the candidates together. And they were saying, well, what about if I win? They were saying, I said, well, look, if you do win, A, you won't be alone because if we had a swing that large, you wouldn't be on your own. So you wouldn't be isolated. And secondly, even if you did nothing, you'd be a damn sight better than the lot who are currently in. And I kind of feel as if Greens, um, people can't copy their policies because we live and breathe it. We articulate and we design the policies. They can't be copied. They've got to be implemented by the people who really believe in it. And I think so long as we go back to our roots, understand why we went into politics, and once we've got the actual possibility to do things, for sure we're gonna be frustrated by all the institutional inertia that we come across. But I think that will be bold. Um, the councillors there will team together they'll be democratic. Sometimes, you know, there might be disagreement about how to implement decisions or where to put budgets. But there's also something called the Association of Green Councillors, which of course has been going from strength to strength. Depending on how you count it, you can count, you know, town councillors. 600 councillors across the country is pretty formidable. And I think there's a great resource there in terms of support network. And it wouldn't just be, you know, the leadership team, which have a definite role in that. You know, I've also spoken to councillors at meetings um, and listened to them about how things are going. So I think it's a great opportunity. There is experience there. And the young councillors, I think, have everything to contribute uh, to be part of that. And finally, I'll just say, we know how much um, pressure there's been on councils up and down the country, particularly during COVID. And we've got a to absolutely like, criminally negligent government nationally, passing the buck, telling the local councils that, it's a devolved responsibility when it suits them, trying to wash their hands of everything. So absolutely, I think, and, and great question, the pressures now are going to be humongous um, for any councillor 
in a position of power. And I think we just need to go back to our, our values, principles, past experience, um, the Association of Green Councillor Network, and I think we will come through and shine through because generally speaking, and the voters come back for more, and you'll, you've seen that in Caroline Lucas, and when we get councillors, people like what they see and they tend to vote them back in their droves. Thank you. Thank you, Shahan. And then, uh, Shaha, and then just one more time before we go over to Sean, uh, I'm going to repeat that question again, uh, which is the Green Party may be about to form the new administration of the local council in Brighton and Hove. What would you do to support the Green Group there, especially young councillors, as they come under a lot of pressure from the press? Over to you, Sean. So, um, yes, it's a very, very interesting situation in Brighton and Hove. And I know that the, the Green Party communications team are already offering all the support they possibly could to uh, the team down there. Um, but but I think it's important to remember um, that, I mean, that what's, what's actually happened in, in Brighton and Hove up to this point. And I think there's at least one or two people on the call who can answer the detail of this question better than me but i mean i've obviously i've been i've been here um and and obviously brighton's one of those places where there's where there's zero love lost between the greens and them and the labor party um it has been in the past utterly vicious between us and there was that period where we ran uh, where we were the the minority administration trying to run the council and the labor party acted in the most appalling way and it was incredibly difficult for, for the greens and it was incredibly difficult for them to stay united and the party down there has learned so much from that experience and they are now um just so amazing it's untrue so you've got to read their statement that they put out today um because um what what happened earlier this earlier last year 2019 um they ended up in, in the reverse position of where they are today. So Labour had, I think, one more councillor than we did. Um, and so Labour formed a minority administration, um, but they, they, they needed the support of the Greens. And, and our team down there, they put aside all of the, 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 the niggles that they might have from working with a, a party who had been literally appalling to them in the past. Um, and they actually put together a programme for the council jointly um, and obviously Labour taking the lead but Greens agreed and they put in place some things to do with um, rough sleeping, to do with the environment, to do with um, the streets and, and, and cycling and all of those kinds of things um, and it's a committee system there so it's different to most councils this is quite you know it's, it's, it's jolly complicated we have control of some of the committees and some of therefore some of the decisions so it's yeah they, they put together a programme and they've been working well with Labour, despite the fact that Labour down there are totally divided amongst themselves. So, you know, absolutely, this is, you talk about doing politics differently and working in the best interests of people. The Greens in Brighton and Hope have been absolutely magnificent and their statement today is magnificent as well. Um, what they say is, you know, residents have no time for the luxury of parties debating seizing power at this time. Um, they say, you know, our foremost concern will be the needs of our city and our residents. Uh, we wait to hear what we, what, what, Labour councillors might come forwards with as a proposal and we stand ready to serve our city. The thing they talk about is continuing with the programme that they put together with Labour and obviously we've all seen this and I've just just this minute come out of a council meeting where I've been discussing with our Labour council the fact that they've suddenly done an enormous amount of work to sort out um, walking, cycling and low traffic neighbourhoods which they were not doing before um, and, and being you know genuinely gen generous with them about that and constructive about how they, what they do things and I think this is just it just shows that, that Greens are a really good influence on politics and that, that we might be the ones who hold Brighton and Hove as a whole together um, by not seizing on the woes of the Labour party down there and actually working to keep some stability in in the way that the cities run and do things in the best interests of residents i'm so i'm so proud of them at the moment thank you so much sean um, and just before we move on to the next question uh, we've deliberately not given candidates time limits for their answers tonight just to make things a bit more fluid uh, and kind of less regimented but it'd be great if we could kind of start uh, moving to some shorter shorter answers so we can get through more of the questions tonight uh, so the next question uh, hopefully will be answered in the order of Shaha, Sean and then Rosie. Uh, and the question is, and again I'm going to repeat this in the chat and before every answer, in your view are trans women women? What are your views on self-identification for trans and non-binary people and why? Uh, so we're going to go straight over to Shaha to start us off. 
So yes, I support and agree with the party policy, which does adequately describe trans women as women. I think it is important to recognize that that's a claim about gender rights um, for the very reason that uh, people who are transitioning have moved away from the gender or sex that they are assigned that was recorded at birth to a different gender. So they've moved to that position and it's a claim about gender. And I think it's really important, um, whatever uh, a person's uh, protected characteristic, whether it's race, sex, gender reassignment, that they feel that the Green Party is looking out for them. And that's what I will be doing as leader, unequivocally. Now, there is a lot of discussion, particularly around this arena. Um, we've had a consultation on the uh, Gender Re um, Recognition Act, which has created a great deal of, of heat, I think more than light. And I like to see that the Green Party shines a beacon on that debate to say, look, here are the set of responsibilities that the government and society owe every single individual who is facing a hard time in the system, either through trying to get a gender recognition certificate. And I mean, I work in uh, medical education as well, and I'm well aware of the, the painfully, woefully inadequate waiting times that trans people are made to suffer. So there were a lot of good things actually in the consultation. And it would be very backward looking step as it looks that some of those things, if they're not gonna be implemented, we will have to fight harder to make sure that they are um, overcome to make the lives of trans people um, easier to live. And ultimately, they're only asking ultimately for rights which they justly deserve. Um, was there another part of the question? Self-identification. Now, I think self-identification, again, I think we've got to encourage debate. It's really important, yes, um, because the terminology as well, it can be interpreted differently. And with the best will in the world, what we have to do, and I understand that I've seen that um, there's a pre-agenda motion to conference uh, about self-identification, and I'm really looking forward to that debate happening because I certainly detect, I mean, I regard myself as a great listener. I think that one shouldn't go into the debate with a closed, fixed opinion. And the great thing about Green Party, and I've, believe me, I've been to some debates. There was a huge debate, Sean will remember as well, about the leadership and people had their different views about empowerment or what are we actually trying to achieve? Does the leader have power? And there was a huge debate, but I think people came together after that. And one of the great things about conference, when we debate well and wisely and attentively and listen to the detail, and I really want to understand um, self-identification better as well, then everybody I think can come together, whatever the outcome is. And I think it's really important that we have that debate. And what we mustn't do is try and preempt that really important debate, because our political party is better than everybody else. We actually prize debate. We want to make sure that we can take ownership of the issues. Thank you. Right, uh, so uh, next we'll move on to the answer for this question from Sean. Um, and the question, once more, Sean, was, in your view, a trans woman woman, what are your views on self-identification for trans and non-binary people and why? Thank you for asking this question in the way that you have. Um, I absolutely support our policy. Trans women are women, trans men are men, non-binary identities are completely valid and we have to be recognising people's right to define who they are. I absolutely think that the Gender Recognition Act needs to be reformed. I'm incredibly worried by the government's um, the rumours about the government going to not only not reform it in the way they basically promised, but also backtrack on some things. Um, and also the, the, some of the, the rhetoric that's, that's been flying around, some of these hustings has worried me enormously. Um, I do worry that people um, trying to focus on categories and definitions why would you do that why are you doing that if you do not want to use those categories and definitions to exclude some people from access to things from from rights and from respect and i think there is something something a bit dodgy going on um, in terms of uh, people trying to raise issues and use this leadership election to create the impression of debate within the Green Party when I know that the vast majority are 
of Green Party members are fully behind all our trans siblings, that the people trying to make a loud noise about this are a tiny, tiny minority. And I think me, myself and Rosie have both been struggling a little bit with the, with the um, desire of some people to, to, to try and get a rise out of us and get us to give more airtime to views which simply do not represent the vast, vast majority of our party and the values that our party stands for. So I hope that's not the most detailed answer to the question, but I hope that is a useful statement to be making in this context, because I really do not like some of what has been going on in some of the hustings, um, particularly in some of the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and then uh, once I've read this question again, we'll move to Rosie to the, for the last answer to this question. Uh, and that question, once again, is, in your view, are trans women women? What are your views on self-identification for trans and non-binary people and why? The short answer to that is, yes, trans women are women. And yes, we should move to a system of self-identification. I agree with everything that Sean said there. Um, I would also add that trans people are one of the most marginalized groups in our society today. Um, I have a, a few trans friends and seeing what they go through is absolutely heartbreaking for me. Um, the amount of abuse that they get just for being who they are. And that is absolutely unacceptable. And we need to be absolutely clear as a party that that is unacceptable. Now, I appreciate the importance of debate in general. However, this is not a symmetrical situation. For me, this is a debate that I can pick up and put down. And today, I mean, if anyone's seen my mentions on Twitter, it's an absolute dumpster fire at the moment. Um, it's been horrendous. That's one day. Trans people go through that all the time. And what we miss, I think, is when we talk about this as a debate, we're asking those people to continually be put in a position where they're forced to justify who they are and forced to justify their right to exist and to take up space in the party and to be faced with all of these um, uh, um, highly theoretical arguments about oh but what if this and what if that when actually all they want to do is live their life and be themselves so the fact that some of those concerns that are going around are really not in good faith yeah there are some people with genuine concerns simply because of the sheer amount of misinformation that has been put around on this on this subject um, but a lot of the people who come out with concerns and I've tried debating a few of these, and when you get into a conversation with them, they'll go round and round and round in circles, and they'll ignore everything you say, and they'll ignore the fact that what they're trying to say they're concerned about is not based in reality and is not something that anyone's ever proposing. Um, and the end result of this is that we've got a situation of false balance. So it's the same way that when you have a debate about climate change and you put some climate science expert on there alongside a bloke from the pub who doesn't want to be told that he can't drive his SUV. This is not a fair and reasonable balanced debate. This is presenting a false balance when there isn't any. And we're in danger of doing the same thing when it comes to trans rights, presenting a false balance um, with all of these uh, false arguments, misinformation, um, and we can't present that in the same way as the very real concerns that trans people are facing in order to live their everyday lives. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Rosie. And that, that concludes our answers to that question there. Um, I'm, I'm aware that, again, time's getting on. So if we could keep answers to maybe two, two to three minutes uh, candidates, that would be ideal. Uh, but hopefully the next question is a bit of a funner one. Uh, so you'll be able to get out of the way in maybe 30, 30 seconds or a minute. Uh, and that question is, oh, and, and the order we'll be going in uh, for this one will be Rosie, then Sean, then Shaha. And the, um, the, the question is, if you had to give each candidate for leader just one present, what would you give them? Uh, so over to Rosie to start us off uh, with a brief answer to this one, please. Oh, God, that's, that's a really difficult one. Um, uh, um, <laughs> I hate this kind of question. I'm, I'm terrible at buying presents for people. Um, I, um, tr 
I mean, book tokens are always good, right? Um, I'm awful at this. I'm when even when it comes to family members, I'm I'm dreadful at buying presents. I'm I'm so indecisive. So uh, come back to me at the end, and I might have I might have thought of something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Sean, if you had to give each leader for candidate, uh, each candidate for leader, just one present, what would you give them? This is so unfair because I've had the entirety of Rosie's answer to think of this. <laughs> so, yeah, discount my my answer as much as you can. So I'd give them each um, an acorn, <laughs> and I'd get them to plant it somewhere in their garden or in a local park. And then one day in the future, when we're all in the House of Lords or the replacement body for the House of Lords, which is fully elected, we can come and visit a, a vast tree to represent the growth of our party since then. See, that was easy when you had 10 minutes to think about it. <laughs> that was so much better than mine. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Um, so Shaha, if you had to give each candidate for leader just one present, what would you give them? So are you talking about um, a present for each other candidate or one present the same for both? You can, you can answer either way. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's think of a present I think that we could all use together, actually. I think that would be a good, um, not that we need an icebreaker at this stage, but I was, I was always impressed with um, Rosie's um, experience um, in, in the kind of the fighting ring. Um, well, a kind of a jujitsu, isn't it? Brazilian jujitsu. And I reckon, well, I wouldn't want us to compete on that level, but I think um, a game, uh, it could be chess or something, it could be hobnobs against um, rich tea or whatever it is, but a game I think that we could all play, I think would be a really interesting um, uh, to find out uh, uh, how, how well we did in, in that one, you know, a, a, a competitive sport potentially. That, that would be my, my idea. Perfect. Thank you, Shaha. And then, Rosie, did you have any last thoughts on this before we move on? Well, once this election campaign is out of the way, I'll be, um, I'm going to be hitting a big bottle of gin, I think. So if the other candidates would like to join me, then they'd be very welcome. Um, that sounds a reasonable answer. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Uh, not, so, not a drinker, unfortunately, but it could be something else. <laughs> Excellent. I do a good coffee um, as well. Perfect. Right. Uh, so moving back uh, maybe to some more serious questions uh, now and uh, just reminding candidates again, if, if you could keep answers about three minutes, that would be fantastic. Uh, and this time we'll answer in the order Sean and Rosie and Shaha. Uh, and this question is, how can you ensure that every region is treated fairly and that there is not effectively a north-south divide in the party? Well, this is the same question about the entire country, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the, we have to make sure that the fact that so many of our members and so much of our um, money raising capacity um, is within London and the South East, but we're still using that money fairly to develop each region's capacity to, to grow, to get to the, to get the, to the same level. And it's, it's an unfair advantage in London. I know that, um, when we um, try to raise money, we've got we've got so many more members. We can ask for money towards the mayoral campaign. Um, so when we had to pause the election and, and and raise money to bridge the gap between now and and when we can properly go out and campaign um, for people um, in public and run crowdfunders and things, um, we we were quite able to find a, a small number of members to ask for for some some small donations per month that would just give us that security to get over and I know there are regions that have do not have this so I think we have to find ways of reviewing how we not only distribute sort of money for on the ground campaigning but use the resources that the national party has to to boost the, the, the campaigning power of places in the um, other parts of the, the country. And I think this is particularly relevant to next year when we've got the London and Wales elections all at the same time, because Wales has a much smaller number of members than, than London does, but the same opportunity to elect people to a body that has um, proportional representation. So um, at the risk of, I mean, to be fair, you know, we are, we are good in London, we can, we can survive. And I think the National Party ought to be putting some of its 
um, resources, its people into the Welsh elections in order to support it. Now, what we were planning to do was learn an awful lot from the London elections that were going to happen this year and then get the people who knew what to do and learned from the London elections to go across to Wales and, and support. And now this can't happen. It has to happen in, 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 in one go. So I think, in, again, in order to make it so that London can't learn and then pass over, um, now, in order to make up for that, the National Party is going to have to think about that. And it is in terms of the field team, the, the, the seniority of the people within the field team who are helping in Wales, um, and all of those things need to be reviewed at a national level. And I know that we are looking at that. And that is a really important part of our revised and review of the, of the strategy alongside the question of where we're going to put resources in order to win our first MPs, building on what we learned during the general election and the second and third places and the, the new council groups that we have from 2019 and the ones we'd have had bigger in this year. So making sure that we, we've got a really good process of prioritising our resources, but also using that to, to, to smooth out the, the regional variations that there naturally are so that no region misses out on having a big group of, of Green Assembly members. And, and having said all of that, the West Midlands is the, is the exception that proves this rule because they've got the most the, one of the smaller memberships, but the most active membership um, in terms of the number of councillors elected and the number of people donating. We've actually set a target in London to get the same proportion of London members donating as they have in the West Midlands. And the, it's so much higher than what we currently have. They are, they are really people to learn from and we are genuinely learning from them. We stole your coordinator to run our London campaign. Um, so there's, there's that, there's that, they are overachieving, but there are other, other regions that need loads more support to get to that same level. Thank you, Sean. Uh, perfect. Thank you. So now um, we'll move to Rosie for her answer on that question. Uh, and uh, once again, that question was, how can you ensure that every region is treated fairly and that there is not effectively a north-south divide in the party? Over to you, Rosie. Thanks for that, Tom. And thanks, Sean, for the, for the kind words about the West Midlands. Um, we are awesome. We, we, we're the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm joking, but um, I think for me, this um, there's a lot of this is about listening. Actually, I think we need to get better at listening to people in those regions and what they what they need, what they what they need from the party, and also taking on board some of the feedback. Um, one of the things I've been doing as part of this campaign is talking to a lot of Green Party members up and down the country in different areas. And one of the common things that I hear is a bit of a frustration that there isn't more communication with the National Party. And a lot of the time, you know, we'll look at what's going on in the National Party and it feels like it, it reflects, um, it's quite London centric, which I mean, obviously given the location and everything, uh, that's, that's understandable. But I think sometimes we could do a better job of channeling some of the talent that we have in all of the other areas as well. And that's going to mean going out and meeting people in those areas and having conversations. That's something I'd, I'd really like to do. If I were elected, I'd make that something that I'd want to do in my first, first month is to, to go and meet all of those regional parties or representatives from all of those regional parties and have a talk about where they are, where they're going, what their ambitions are and what they might need in terms of support um, and as Sean said there, there's some issues around resource and about, about how to support different areas um, in terms of the various campaigns and I mean obviously everyone's on different schedules when it comes to elections things like that um, but I think a lot of it does come down to having sort of some clearer channels of communication and making sure that those um, those doors are open for, for feedback and for uh, for listening and taking on board the, the challenges that the, the different regions are facing. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, so, Shaha, how can you ensure that every region is treated fairly and that there is not effectively a north-south divide in the party? So, I don't know what the um, current information is on that and where you would start the north and the south, but there's also Wales to contend with and whether they count as part of this matrix. But yeah, I do have a few ideas. And um, having served on GPEX for a couple of years as one amongst equals, we used to debate finances. We used to debate whether or not we should accept um, a donation from a, from a rich, famous individual. And actually, funny enough, the Young Greens had um, quite a view on that. Um, 
that you know should should we accept money from from a fashion icon um did it really fit in with our values and i think one of the best things about about the young greens is that they they keep the rest of the party on their toes because i think they remind us really what our values are if there were any risk of us becoming like the other political parties and i hope that you know in the best tradition that they would do that um which is why it's good to have more young greens standing for gpex but i would say um it, how we could improve this is to um well at a stroke we could relocate headquarters um we could reduce its size there's a lot of rent goes into um the biscuit factory uh, we could relocate we could indulge in encourage more home working particularly post lockdown i think you know people are trying to are getting quite good at it that isn't to minimize the importance of social contact but if we were to relocate um hq i think that would also send the right signal that it's a national party if we were also to get better obviously it's easier said than done at saving our deposits um at risk of getting political at this point um those every time that we um entered into a progressive alliance or a unite to remain lib dem pact last year that and it failed that resulted in less deposits saved we got i think we saved about 30 odd deposits in 2019 uh, as opposed to um over 100 in 2015 that has a huge sort of financial impact on the local parties affected um, and it affects their motivation so this is a very important question about how we equitably share out the national um party memberships um what level of capitation there should be going into the regions what level going into the local parties when it happens it should be happening efficiently on time on track so that local parties can budget effectively and we often talk about being more professional don't we and i think that's got to be part of being professional is that we can we can manage expectations in the regions uh, in the local parties and be wholly transparent about that money and on staffing costs as well it's very difficult to know and to uh, find the information i'm not talking about individuals i'm just talking about post holders like a like you know organogram um you know what is the relationship between all the staff across the country i think that's information which all members should also have at their disposal so that they can have a say in it and we're going into um finally a governance review um some of you may have heard of the holistic review commission and proposals to you know, we just start uh, wrapping up in the next 20 seconds or so, Shaha, that'd be great. I can end there. So, thanks, Tom. Perfect. Sorry to uh, no, unmute right. myself in the middle of your answer. Uh, perfect. So, uh, we're going to move on to the next question now, uh, in the order of Rosie, then Shaha, then Sean, uh, and just keep an eye on that time limit as well, please, guys. Uh, so, this question is, what is the Green Party's role to play in class struggle? How does the Green Party get to the position where we are perceived as the party of the working class disadvantages, uh, disadvantaged and people of colour and all of the above. Uh, so over to you, Rosie. Great. So this is a really good question. I think this ties in with what I've been talking about uh, when I say that we need to be perceived as addressing the day to day issues that people are facing in their everyday lives. When you're in a position where you're struggling with poverty, struggling with um, inequality, discrimination, and you're wondering how you're going to put food on the table next week, it's very hard to think about the climate emergency and what's going to happen in 10 20 years time um, and i think in order to get those groups to vote for us and to think of us as their natural allies um, we need to be addressing more directly now i know that there is some um there, some of our party does this very well and i think shan's actually a very good example of somebody who talks a lot about issues of um inequality and um the issues that matter to people. Um, I think sometimes in our national communications, uh, it doesn't always feature as prominently as maybe some of the other issues. So that's something that we can uh, we can do. When it comes to how do we attract people from these groups? Um, again, our, our, our membership in general is fairly white and middle class. You know, our, certainly our councillor representation is quite white and middle class, um, and one of the things that we found in Solihull is that the way to get 
people invested in, in the Green Party is not to go out and talk to them about the issues that we care about or that we think they should care about. It's to go out and ask them what they need and to talk about what would make a real difference to them. So in the context of local politics, we're talking about the issues that matter to them in their ward. Now, in Solihull, we have the safest green ward in the country. It's Chelmsley Wood, and 84% of people there voted green. It's also a ward that it has some council estates. It has some of the, um, some of the areas in Chelmsley Wood are in the bottom 10%, the most deprived areas in the country. It's definitely not the kind of ward you'd think of as stereotypical green voters. Um, the way we've been successful there is by, over time, engaging with the community there on local interest issues. And that's what's allowed us to build up um, that support. So it's something that needs to happen over time. It's not something that you can do suddenly. And particularly when we're talking about issues of diversity, we absolutely shouldn't be going in with um, a quota system or a, a, a checkbox approach where it's like, oh, we just need to recruit somebody who fits these demographics to, to round out our, our profile. Um, it's it's got to be developed from the ground up. It's got to be developed by actually working with those communities and making sure that we're speaking Can I push you to start finishing and, up, Rosie, please? Yeah, and, and when we do that, what we find is that those people come to us. And at the moment, I think we've got a third of the BME councillors in the National Party in Solihull. We've got two more target candidates for the next election cycle as well. Thank you, uh, Rosie. So next up answering this question will be Shaha. And once more, the question was, what is the Green Party's role to play in class struggle? How does the Green Party get to the position where we are perceived as the party of the working class, disadvantaged people of colour and all of the above? That is definitely more than one question, but uh, I'll have a go. Um, I think firstly, I, I've come across many times debates and um, members in the party who actually didn't feel that their voices were being heard as working class. And um, even I've been hearing uh, in some of the deputy leader hustings, um, Cleo in particular has been talking about class and she's got a great analysis and wondering whether there shouldn't be a place for class um, as, a, as a protected characteristic even in the Equality Act. And I think it's really good to be talking about it at that level, but also at the level of actual grassroots action. Now, you know, working in uh, medical education in particular, it's been very full on uh, during the COVID lockdown in terms of trying to get uh, medical practitioners on the front line in a very high risk environment. And I know full well working in, in Tower Hamlets, um, um, Whitechapel, how bad it is for key workers. And what are they if not the working class as traditionally understood? And if there's one thing which um, this pandemic has taught us, this is that it's the most invaluable workers who are getting least rewarded uh, for their work. And in this case, very dangerous work, uh, whether it's in health or even in education in the schools, we're relying upon these key workers, frontline workers to do the best by our families and for the whole of society. And I think the Green Party has always been about looking after those vulnerable, whether it's universal basic income. And we've seen um, Rishi Sunak uh, turn into something like a state capitalist. So we've got the analysis which exposes the utter bankruptcy and hypocrisy of that economic system. And we need to be making that case loudly, boldly, making clear that people understand that we're looking after them. And if we get campaign for and implement a Green New Deal, whilst we've got all this state of flux, it's the perfect time to do it. That will, at a stroke, bring jobs to an area where we're, going, we're facing, you know, 10 million unemployed in the next few months, potentially. We've got youth unemployment like there's no tomorrow. People coming out of, and finally, because you're going to stop me in a minute, aren't you, Tom? Yeah, can we finish uh, in the next 10 seconds or so? <laughs> people coming out of university with record debt, fees, and their maintenance, and no job to go into. That is horrendous. So... You know, there's the working class struggle, there's the unionization that we defend, and there's also the fact that everybody now is facing mass unemployment or job insecurity, and we need to be articulating that. We need to be, thank you. 
Thank you, Shahal. Uh, so over to Sean now for the last answer on this question, uh, which one more time is, uh, what is the Green Party's role to play in class struggle? How does the Green Party get to the position where we are perceived as the party of the working class, disadvantaged people of colour and all of the above? Yeah, this is just the kind of question that lends itself to a short answer. I just have to give you give you credit for that. <laughs> um, I really want to come back and do a whole bit on this because it's so, this is absolutely crucial to the ideas we've been putting forward about system change for so long. And I think um, there's been, I think on the left, uh, uh, this really unhealthy focus on must pull behind Corbyn, must pull behind Corbyn, don't criticise Labour, um, that's, that's really unhelpful. And the dam might be about to break. And so I want to remind you of a few ways in which the Labour Party have not been the party of the working class in recent years i mean look at try if you look at the film dispossession which i'm in there's a chart and it shows um the number of council homes being built and the number of council homes whittling away under different different parties and obviously thatcher introduces right to buy and it starts to fall and fall and fall and fall and it keeps falling. and there's a there's, there's it's just n nothing's happened and if you look at that chart going from the, the 80s to the present day i dare you to spot the new Labour government from 97 to, to 2010, because you cannot see it. There is no change in, in the, the council housing provision or the, the decline in council housing provision, thanks to Labour. Um, and, and the phrase sink estates and the demolition programmes, these were, these were new Labour programmes. And I cannot, I remember vividly, and, you're pro and I'm going to shout out the phrase, you're probably too young to remember this, but I remember vividly the fury I felt when it was revealed that the Labour Party were putting up these posters when they were in government with these targets on people who were like stereotype members of the working class going, if you cheat the benefit system, we're watching you. And it turned out they were putting those posters in, in areas where there were more Tory voters to try and convince the Tory voters that they, I, I, like the, the layers of, of rudeness to your class that are going on there as the Labour Party. Unbelievable. Now, I mean, things, things also didn't get any better for private renters and across other areas of homelessness under Labour, though arguably the number of people on the streets homeless did get better. Um, but I think young people are suffering from the legacy of things not having been made better by the Labour government and then having been made significantly worse by the Conservatives and Lib Dems under austerity, to the extent now where we have young people of working class. 30 seconds, please, Sean. You are suffering from, from the least job security, the highest rents, the least rights in terms of how they live their lives of, of any generation we've had before. And if we can't be the party of that generation who are also very fired up about climate change and the future, when we've got a Labour Party shifting to the right, then I do not know what our job is. And I am on a massive mission to make this at, at the whole, the intersection of class and race and climate justice and future justice justice and global justice, all of these things are right there in our party and there's a whole load of people out there who are ready to join us and fight for this range of causes and it's and it could be so um, You Sean, brilliant, thank you and sorry to keep pushing uh, you guys on those uh, answer times here but we've got a few more important questions we'd like to go through uh, and the next one is is incredibly important um, but maybe we could keep your answers to this one to about a sentence uh, and we'll go in the order of Shaha, then Sean, then Rosie uh, and this question is what is your favourite flavour of crisps? Uh, so over to you, Shaw. Right. Um, it's Worcester sauce. Nice. Uh, easy. Uh, thank you, Shaha. Uh, Sean, what's your favourite flavour crisps? Yeah, you can't just ask what flavour. That doesn't work. You have to ask what are your favourite crisps, because my favourite crisps <laughs> bad crisps the ones that are made of like maize and come in shapes right they are amazing and for those kinds of crisps it's a really really hard one because there's loads of really meaty flavors that taste really good and are not meat so there's beef uh, monster munch for example which are absolutely amazing <laughs> Uh, there's there's bacon wheat crunchies which are actually made of wheat obviously not maize um, and then there's the your good old cheap onion rings in a big bag they are brilliant too so yeah those are my those are my top three at the moment although I'm quite, <laughs> quite fickle and change my mind sometimes excellent and thank you so uh, Rosie what are your favourite favourite crisps uh, Terrell's vegetable crisps 
They're really good. Fair answer. Thank you very much. And thanks, guys, for keeping that one short. Uh, the next one's quite a simple question, so we can hopefully keep that question, uh, this one short as well. Uh, this is a pre-submitted one uh, that's come up, and uh, we'll answer it in the uh, order of Sean, then Rosie, then Shaha. And that question is, would you ban halal meat? Uh, over to Sean. No, it's not our policy. And, um, you know, nobody, nobody should be saying that. And Jonathan, who did say that, was very very sorry immediately and and i know that there's there's still lots of making up to do um but no no obviously not uh thank you for a brief answer for that one sean uh, so rosie would you ban halal meat no no i wouldn't i think there are it's entirely right that there's lots of animal rights issues to do with it, it, across the whole of our society but i think picking on picking out one particular group to highlight those concerns is absolutely wrong um, because actually uh, to be honest anywhere that um, anyone who eats meat um, uh, is uh, th there there are similar similar concerns so i don't think it's it's something you can you can look at just one group within society. We have to look at it across the whole. And I think our approach of highlighting animal rights concerns generally and how, how we can improve standards is the right one. Um, when there are um, specific issues, we've got to look, make sure that that's dealt with appropriately uh, in, a, in a culturally competent way rather than... Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 th I think I've, I've made my point on that. So I think that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Uh, so over to Shaha to be the last quick answer to this question. And the question again was, would you ban halal meat? Uh, no, we shouldn't ban halal meat. We shouldn't be advocating for it. Of course, as Shaha has already mentioned, it was a big mistake for those remarks to be made. Um, unfortunately, we didn't do enough to uh, either apologise quickly enough because the comments were being made more than once throughout the day, um, nor did we actually respond officially well enough. We had the Jewish Board of Deputies worried about the remarks and condemning them. We had the Muslim Council of Britain condemning them. We did maximum damage. I was being asked about it on, in hustings during the general election. It completely made us incredible or it, lacking credibility. So yeah, we've got to be careful about these things. Um, you know, I would just add that what you'll be electing, uh, who you'll be electing is, is a spokesperson, a primary spokesperson. And I think you've got to have absolute confidence, ultimately, that they wouldn't make gaffes like that. We all make mistakes, but, you know, some gaffes are bigger than others. Um, I really can't understand how anybody could have made such a mistake uh, experience though, uh, as they were. Thank you, Shaha. So we've got a uh, couple more questions we'd like to ask. Uh, so maybe we can get this next one down to two minutes. Uh, and we'll be ask, oh, sorry, answering it in the order of Rosie, then Shaha, then Sean. Uh, and this question is very relevant to this hustings, uh, and it is, uh, how would you support the Young Greens to build a powerful and effective progressive youth wing of the party? Uh, so Rosie, you're up first for this one. I'm starting to feel like a bit of a, a stuck record here, um, because I think the first step with any of these things has to start with listening. It has to start with, um, having some conversations about where you are at the moment and where you see yourselves going because the thing with any kind of a vision is it's not something that can be imposed from the top down it's something that has to to grow from, from the bottom up I and mean, that's fundamental to our our philosophy as greens so it would be about engaging with you guys and figuring out what that vision looks like and then what support the, the party leadership can give you in order to to grow that um, so in terms of sort of lists of you know my plan and my bullet points and things that's not really the way that I would see this going I would see this being much more something we put together as a joint effort rather than you know um, any of my ideas in particular, which may turn out not to be what you guys want. 
Perfect. Uh, then if we could go to Shahar to answer the question, how would you support the Young Greens to build a powerful and effective progressive youth wing of the party? So as um, leader of the Green Party, if elected, I think one of the very important roles is meeting people, going around, building relationships and also being a facilitator of relationships. And I think one of the areas where I think we can all do better as a party is to make sure that groups within the party have a means and are encouraged to work together. Um, you know, there is a, a risk sometimes, you know, in any organization of, of a kind of a siloed mentality. And really, I think we're always better when we're working together. And, you know, I sometimes hear um, older Greens in the party feeling that they can't engage with young Greens. And I think that is obviously got to be a two way street. And something that I hope um, to be able to facilitate. Uh, I'd want to be having very regular catch ups, um, not just with executive members of Young Greens, but also um, ordinary members who are extraordinary members. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that was a nice and brief answer, uh, answer as well, Shahar. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and then over for the final answer on this one to Sean, how would you support the Young Greens to build a powerful and effective progressive youth wing of the party? I mean, I think when you're when you're talking about um, a party and, a, and an organisation where where a lot of the people involved are volunteers, where you've got different branches who are quite autonomous, these are all, these are the types of organisations I've I've often worked in. A lot of charities have this same sort of balance of people who are putting together the strategies and then you've got the local groups and local teams who need to feed in to, to that strategy and have that sort of iteration and I think that is something that we've got to be doing for the new strategy to make sure that we've got all the different groups who we want to be helping to implement it to be you know following the 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 strategy of talking about system change, if that's the sort of goal that I, that I really want to get in there, um, to make sure that each group that can contribute is able to contribute and able to be coherent with the rest of the party in a way that fully respects the autonomy of those different groups. And that is about you know, good teamwork um, and good planning and lots of transparency and lots of listening on every single side and I think when you're implementing something like that and you're, you're trying to move forwards constant communication is really really important and I think the National Party team have taken huge strides in the last I don't know like eight months basically which is how long it is since two of our most important um, national uh, team staff team members actually came in um, and we're, since then we've also hired an amazing digital manager and that team have been working for the last eight months just forging new ways and new communication with the different groups like the young greens like greens of color like lgbtiqa plus greens to find ways that we can amplify the work that you're doing and make sure that we're trying to get you to feed into the next strategies and this is full of pitfalls um which we're starting to discover and this is where the part of the um the, the code of conduct that says think the best of each other is really really important because everyone's trying to get everything together in a way that so that everything works and then something starts to work and you kind of race ahead with it and everyone's like what are you doing who gave you permission to do that and this is something that, that all of us on gfx always have to have as our our sort of watchword is you know have we actually got the proper permission because we're such a distributed party so i think that the the way things have got better is with we start finishing up here please sean and with chats like this online to warn people of what we're doing and, and and more phone calls and more chats and i think i think things are getting better because there isn't a simple formula to how to work well together as a team but as far as we're concerned as the green party there are a really simple set of messages and policies that we need to be working better to get out there to people and to mobilize people around and so we've got to, we've got to get the emphasis right so that we've got these different groups who are able to contribute to this this coherent strategy and we're not racing ahead of each other and, and getting in each other's way and stepping on each other's toes at the same time so yeah it's, it's a work in progress but all good teams are, are like that and and if you ask me it's like it's where i'd rather the mess was that we're all doing things and misunderstanding each other rather than there being a proper like in the Labour Party it's incredibly top down and people are being told what to do and banned from doing other things. Thank you Sean, do you mind if I uh, this party. It's, it's a bit of a mess sometimes but it's a really healthy mess if that makes sense.
Thank you, Sean. Uh, so we're now slightly run over. Um, and before we go to the opening sentence, there's one more question uh, that I'd like to ask. Uh, and this is another one that you can answer in a quick, short sentence. Um, and I think I'd immediately be chucked out my role if I didn't ask it. Uh, and that question, uh, which we'll answer in the order of uh, Sean and Rosie, then Shahal, please. Uh, is a, a simple one. What is your favourite biscuit, uh, Sean? Malted milks. Uh, quick answer, thank you, Sean. Uh, over to Rosie. What is your favourite biscuit? Chocolate hobnobs, but specifically dark cho chocolate hobnobs, in fact. Um, I've had time to think further on this, and dark chocolate hobnobs are definitely better than the milk chocolate ones. I, I feel like that distinction there between dark and milk there is quite important. Um, and over to Shaha for the for the last answer to this question. What's your so I've, I've already um, I've already been pulled up a bit for using Jaffa cake, but I, I I gather Jaffa cake's doing quite well in round one at the minute, and it's not far long left to to vote on that in your um, head to head. Um, but another biscuit um, would probably be chocolate fingers. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, We've noted down your answers to those ones and I'm sure they'll be crucial uh, in deciding who people vote for. Uh, so thank you very much to all our candidates for answering our questions tonight. Uh, just before we go um, and hear from Katrina about uh, how to get involved with our next hustings, uh, we'd like to go to each of the candidates uh, for their closing speeches for which they've got two minutes and I will be uh, judicial in stopping you overrunning in these ones. Uh, so we'll be doing these in reverse order to the way we started. Uh, so we'll go Sh uh, Shaha, then Sean, then Rosie. Uh, so over to you, Shaha, for a two-minute closing speech. Thanks, Tom. I've uh, really enjoyed it. I think it's been a great um, relaxing atmosphere uh, with all your, all your sort of uh, spiced up questions at the same time. What you've got before you is a formidable array of candidates for the leadership. And I hope you'll give me your every consideration. There may be things that um, you may have even heard about me. Uh, that you'd like to me to, uh, to have cleared up and you can by any means contact me to do that. You may even disagree ultimately with a few things but I think the great thing about the Green Party is that we should be able to have um, disagreement from time to time but the ultimate raison d'etre for us being in the party is that common goal of social and climate ecological justice and this is the number one priority that I'll be putting my shoulder to the wheel on if you were to elect me as your leader, which would be a privilege and an honor. And there are so many areas where the younger generation in particular are gonna be at the sharp end of the brunt of the negative harmful consequences of climate change. And I want you to put your trust in me and I will deliver on that. I don't have other Green Party elected roles, and I think that would allow me to dedicate myself to this role as your primary spokesperson and as a motivator, I hope, as well, up and down the country, showing the way, leading the way and being led by you too. Thank you. Thank you, Shaha. Uh, Sean, your closing speech, please. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed this and I've, I've been so proud to be co-leader for the past and it's only been 22 months since I since I took over but it's been the, the fastest 22 months um, of, of my life and I think for a lot of people it has been too with these continual elections and it would have been it's been three and it would have been four major elections in that period so you know, the Young Greens have been an amazing support to, to me personally <laughs> to the party as a whole in those last 20 in those past 22 months and we've shown such progress as a party we've we've grown we've grown our credibility and I think there's there's a real chance now that with just an extra boost in in what we do and, and the extra professionalism to say so but the better the better organization that there is and the way that people will see us acting in a way that is just more organized and more credible has got a real opportunity to turn us into something absolutely enormous so just to recap on our three pitches me and Jonathan we want to see clear new messages clarity around the fact that we need system change and lots of activity to back 
up all the different points there are to be made around that so that so that this comes together as a clear message they know that we stand for more credibility through fighting those those elections that are coming up exactly right and, and winning more green councillors there's and there's young greens who would have been councillors already who who will be the next time we have elections and and then working together with our allies to actually make some change happen because we know why we're doing this is the deadlines for climate chaos, for the ecological emergency, and, and the need to save lives and build a new social contract for this country. None of those things go away while we wait to win power. We have to get on with working with our allies to get change to happen. And the Young Greens are, some, are gonna be some of our best allies in building that new mass movement to achieve real change that we absolutely need. So yes, I really, I love this Thank job. Thank you, Sean. I'm gonna stop you there because that's two minutes. This first again in your election this year. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, over to Rosie for her two minute closing speech, please. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, everyone, for what's been a great evening. Um, and it's been it's been great to, to talk to you about some of my vision for how we go forward as a party. To answer the question, why should you vote for me, which I didn't answer at the beginning. What I'm presenting is a vision my idea of the future of this party. Now, whether you agree with that, whether that's your vision as well, is, is up to you. So I'm not going to tell you that you should vote for me. I'm offering you my ideas about, about where we go forwards. And for me, this is a debate very much about the future of our party. I think all of the candidates here, we all share very similar green values. We care about the climate, we care about social justice, we care about um, grassroots, participatory democracy. Um, but my belief is that we need to be more than a pressure group. Uh, we can't just afford to be a campaigning organization or a lifestyle movement because those already exist elsewhere. They do some excellent work, but it's not what we, who we are. Um, it's only we can get Greens into the corridors of power and at the table when important decisions are being made. And that for me is what we should focus on. So in the last few years, Green councillors in Solihull have pushed the Conservatives into declaring a climate emergency, pushed for a ban on single-use plastics, saved Greenbelt land, offered homes to Syrian refugees, and we were the first council to set up a COVID hardship fund for social care workers because of the work that we did. And I know that Green councillors up and down the country have been doing similar things. So this is why getting Greens elected matters. And I want there to be more Green councillors, MPs and Assembly members, and I would love for some of the people on this call, some of the young Greens, to be part of that future. So if you're serious about inclusion, serious about credibility, and serious about winning elections, then make me your first choice for leader. Perfect, thank you, Rosie. Uh, exactly on two minutes. Uh, so once more, uh, as we finish up here, I'd like to thank all the candidates uh, tonight for engaging in uh, some good measured debate uh, and for joining us here um, so young Greens can ask uh, their questions to you. Uh, now, just before we go, and by the way, candidates, I know we're 10 minutes over, so you're free to go off and have your dinners or, or get on with whatever work you need to do. Um, I'd like to uh, hand over to Katrina, who's going to, oh, <laughs> Shaha's got Pringles for dinner. Uh, excellent. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Katrina uh, now to give you the run through of what we've com got coming up in the next few weeks. Oh, thank you, Tom. And thank you again to our candidates for coming along tonight. Um, I will be quick because I'm aware that we are over time. What I'm going to do is post five links for you in the chat box, as we like to do at the Young Greens. Um, no matter how much I click on everyone at the moment, it's still saying they're going privately to Rosie. So maybe Rosie will have to post them in the chat for me. Um, but the first one, um, as you know, the leader is not the only position up for election at the moment. And um, for the positions we haven't been able to do a live Young Greens Huston, we've asked them some questions um, and we have, oh no, it has come to everyone, and we have published those um, on our website. So the first one, you might see some more biscuit questions in there, um, but there are written hustings for some of the candidates, um, all the other positions that are open. Um, two of the positions we are running hustings for are the Deputy Leader um, and our House of Lords nominee. So uh, our Deputy Leader hustings are on the 28th of July, and there's a going in now. Yep, yeah, there we go. And the House of Lords are on the 31st of July. So that'll be very similar to these ones. Um, great to have as many of you as possible to come along, ask some questions, get lots of um, biscuits, crisps, politics, policies, whatever you want. Everything's open. It's all on the table. Uh, the last two, uh, so I'm just going to put in a link just now. Um, 
As Rosie mentioned a bit at the beginning, and so did I, we've been running a lot of different events over lockdown. Um, in normal times, we run a lot of real life events. We do campaigns, as Sean mentioned, we run lots of action days all over the place, um, and that does cost money. Um, so if you are in a position to at the moment, and I know not everybody is, because it's a very difficult time and there's a lot of things going on and people are in a lot of difficult situations, but if you are in a position to be able to, if you could donate two pounds a month to us so we can keep that work going, there is a link in the chat that allows you to do that very easily via our website. We like to make it easy for you. Um, and then the last thing is uh, a click to tweet. So as we say, that's when we put words into your mouth. So if you click on this link that I've posted in the chat now, it'll open up your Twitter, if you have Twitter, um, with a pre-written tweet for you saying that you've just quizzed your candidates um, and that we can do so again for the deputy leader on the 28th of July. And um, if you have other social medias, please um, do post about this and share it and share our other um, events as well, but you'll have to write your own for that. Sorry, we've only given you Twitter. Uh, do you want to pass back over to Tom? Just a quick goodbye. But thanks very thank much. Thank you Claire. so much, Katrina. Um, and thank you everybody who's come along today. And hopefully we'll see you next Tuesday, same time, uh, same place uh, for the Deputy Leadership Hostings. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the candidates. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. I've yet to have my dinner yet, so uh, you could all disappear <laughs> off quite quickly. Yeah, I'm quite keen please. to get, uh, get eaten. <laughs> stop recording before they find out what you're eating. Thank <laughs> you.